everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine Gustafson. I'm co-chair of the Alumni to Alumni Committee with Jeff Feldman, who's also on the call. Uh, we want to welcome you tonight to our must-see Yale program. This is Life and Personal Growth, and we're delighted to have our speaker, the Reverend David Messner. Uh, but before we get started, uh, Jeff is going to do a quick intro as to what uh, we have coming up in the next few weeks, and then we'll give you a quick minute on cross campus and then we'll get started. Great, Thank, thanks Elaine and thanks for everyone coming. Uh, we're doing this every every week as you know and I tell you it's starting to make friends here. I could see the you know, same names coming up during the week, we're seeing new names all the time so welcome everybody that's coming and we're pretty excited about this this whole program we've got. Uh, we're doing rolling Thursday so every Thursday at 8 you're, you're welcome to join us. Uh, we cover various topics. We've got one show called the STEM Report one show on career pivots, one on the human experience, and uh, one on life and personal growth, which is tonight's show. They go on rolling episodes, so every you know every fifth week you'll see that same topic. So if you like the topic, show up then. If you just want to hear and meet some other Yaleys, uh, please do it. These are the next four shows that are coming up. We have tonight's. Uh, next week we have the human experience. Uh, following week is a STEM report, and then a career pivots, and then we do it all again. So uh, thanks again for coming. We're all very excited about it at the YAA and we really appreciate your support. Uh, the other thing we wanted to mention is the great platform that we have called Cross Campus. So the YAA has launched the Cross Campus, uh, which is your own personal way to get more connected in the Yale community. And, and Steve Bloom, uh, who really drives things for us at the YAA and for this platform, will tell you more about it. Uh, both of the things I just mentioned will be on links for the chat session, so you should see these uh, when we're done. Uh, Steve, I'll give it to you for a, a minute or two, sure. Sure, and I, I really do want us to get us uh, to the main course of tonight, so this will be super fast. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, we launched just a few months ago an online community to bring Yaleys even closer together. It's an opportunity for alumni to uh, connect with each other and for students to connect with alumni. So far, more than 15,000 members of the Yale community have joined, far, far more than we had expected, and thousands of unique connections have been made on the platform. It's a chance for any of you to network, to give or gain advice, or to give or gain mentorship. So when you see the link in the chat box, if you haven't joined Cross Campus, please do. If you have, please go back. And finally, uh, take the opportunity to join our mentorship program. Thanks very much. Thanks, Steve. And then uh, just before I hand it back to you, Elaine, just to mention to folks who are new, we kind of run this, uh, you know, half Dick Cavett and half Phil Donahue. So, you know, Elaine will kind of go through, we'll hear Dave's background. And then if you have Q&A, throw them in the chat or you can ask live. Uh, we like engagement. We like to hear different voices. So uh, enjoy. I will say too, Dave Mezzer is an old friend. He's one of my classmates from School of Management. And, uh, you know, you have those core relationships that just stick through life. Dave's one of those for me. So uh, I have nothing but great things to say and enjoy the show. Elaine? Great. Well, we're delighted to have David tonight. Um, and thank you, Jeff, for uh, introducing him to us. Uh, this Life and Personal Growth Program uh, it should be very inspiring, I'm sure. Uh, we do have chat available and folks that want to put their questions while David's speaking into the chat, would, that would be fine. And we can either calling you to ask your question or we're happy to ask them for you whichever you prefer uh, just to give you a little brief background on David and he's going to really introduce himself much more broadly but uh, he's Reverend Mesner is currently the interim minister of the Unitarian Church in Charleston South Carolina he earned his master's from the University of Chicago with an emphasis on theology and religious ethics but prior to that he received his MBA from Yale University with a concentration in strategy and organizational behavior. So uh, David, uh, may have, I may have had them and maybe it was after this but anyway it, uh, David has some interesting background to share with us. Uh, he currently lives in Skidaway Island, uh, Georgia which sounds very exotic. Uh, with his wife and two teenagers and uh, a blue healer dog that he's quite proud of. So we're looking forward to hearing more about you, David. Thank you. Thank you so much. My wife is taking charge of the dog. The dog wanted to be here, but she's in her own space. Uh, I appreciate this invitation. Actually, I just put it on my resume as a visiting lectureship at Yale, the Feldman Gustafson uh, <laughs> lectureship. And so I, I'm expecting that that will, will bear fruit 
uh, on its own. So we've already won. Uh, as as Jeff said and, and Elaine said, I, I went to school management and finished there in '95, which sounds really recent to me, but but is some some time ago. In school, I, I was really interested in strategy. I guess I, I wanted to say that as a backdrop to sort of where I sit and how I understand strategy is is something to do with how we understand the world around us and how we act in response to how we are anticipating the world acting upon us. Uh, we are in a kind of interactive, uh, creative interchange, uh, dialogical world of back and forth to figure out and uh, to figure out what we do and, and very simply to get our bearings. So I, I think that's what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, I'm talking about getting our bearings at a time of disorientation. And as I said, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to be here. I speak from a number of different places. My first career was business where I thought about what does it mean for an institution navigating economic space and markets. My second career has been in in church, and so I spend more time, though I think about the life of the church and how it projects itself into the public sphere, uh, I spend more time thinking about individuals and how do we make sense and, and plot our own course and what's ahead of us. Uh, my, my, my hobby now, my dissertation committee would shudder if they heard me say it was a hobby, but I checked and they're not here. I'm finishing my PhD at uh, Emory uh, in, in ethics and society and thinking there about virtue in institutions and how institutions sometimes work against virtue and how despite adversity, we figure out how to manage our own formation and be good people, be good workers and be good people, do our duty and do something beyond that uh, and perhaps something deeper. So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from today. Uh, the title of the talk, Someone will put up the title of the talk. It's it has to do with reemergence and reinvention in the almost post-COVID era. So I'm going to focus a lot about the unusual character of the time in which we're suspended between between two things. And I know this isn't normal time, but I also know that we wouldn't be together in normal time. I don't know if this series was happening in with this robustness and with this group. And I don't know, there are 50 of us here or so. Uh, and it's rather extraordinary, and, and that is a, a simple metaphor, a simple example of, that I'm going to expand to talk about why in this extraordinary time we may get our bearings and set our course for something different than otherwise would have happened. So I, I hate to say it, I, I put it in the note, I, I don't mean to be a silver lining kind of guy. Like how fabulous the house burned down, I didn't like the kitchen anyway. No, I mean that's not exactly not exactly right, but there's, there's something of that I get to the spirit of here. So to me, and I'll move between secular and religious language, and it'll be inclusive in the sense that, uh, in, you know, I'm a Unitarian, and I, so I won't give you a whole talk on that, but it has to do with receiving people who have different sort of belief structures and coming into common conversation about how we should live and how we should discover the world around us. And I'll say that a faithful life to me, a meaningful life, uh, is about how you respond to the question that the world is asking you. Or for the religious folks among us, well, what question is God asking? You're an answer. You didn't arrive at the beginning of it all. We're reminded that in scripture. Where were you? Where were you when I formed the world? But you arrive uh, being asked a question to which you're supposed to respond. You walk into the classroom and on that first day and the professor looks at you and asks you the question, and you want to say, but I haven't read the material yet. I haven't been given the syllabus. It's not time. It's not fair. But you're asked the question from the very first day. And now, not many of us just fell off the turnip truck. What's the saying? I don't know. Some Southern saying. I try and pick up these Southernisms, but it's slow, slow going. Um, but so not all of us have figured out our answer to the question. Not all of us have figured out what the question is. And I'm suggesting, and you'll, you know, uh, there are some of us, a lot of you have your cameras off. My church, I chase people down when their cameras off. I want to see what they look like. I, I know they're in their pajamas. Are you already in pajamas? How old is this group? I don't, I have no idea. I have no idea. You might not have gotten out of your pajamas today. I don't know. Anyway, 
But so I don't know, I don't know where you are in life cycle. That really matters, joking aside, as to when you have moments that you might take uh, some reflective space to, to take stock and understanding of, of what, what the question's being asked of you. And are you rising to the task of answering it in a way that's satisfactory to you? And here, you know, this is, this is voluntary, this is ungraded. I mean, you can even hang up, that'd be terrible, but you could do it. And, and so I'm saying in the private world of your COVID house and the private world of your own heart, what question do you think you're answering? And that's what's important. What are the kinds of things that might be a life question? How many clam and bacon pizzas can one person eat in four years? Have you answered that question? Not a suitable life question. It's a joke. I'm trying, you know, New Haven. That's it. But that's not right. It can't be right. How, how big a yacht can a person build and captain around the world? So material. Maybe we have some people who are materially well off. I live on an island. And one day, uh, a thing called the EOS pulled up next to my island, which is really remarkable. You don't usually notice a boat pulling up next to your island, but if we have any mariners here, the Eos is Barry Diller's old boat, 305 feet long, three-masted sailboat, biggest in the world, second biggest, I don't know, something like that. Makes a case for itself. Bigger than our island, pulled up next to it. Makes a case for itself. But that can't be right. Is that the question life is asking you how big a boat can you build how big i don't think it can be right so what sorts of things can be life questions and i i'm not going to give you your question what is happiness right what is beauty what is justice those are big enough right and then the paradoxical questions what does it look like to give everything away yet sacrifice nothing it's a religious question what does it feel like and look like to be a complete and total and authentic self, yet part of a contiguous whole of community, a total individual and totally belonging. Paradoxical questions. Those are religious questions. Those are good now. And so I ask you, I want to plant the seed. Mostly I'm planting seeds on work I want you to do. If you're in my church, we'd be doing it in small group breakouts for the rest of the month. You can come to my church. Charleston's nice. You can zoom in. Uh, I told him I didn't have a lot to sell right now. I should get a book. But I didn't know what to sell, but I'll sell you on, you can come to my church and we'll do the small group work because it's not really about what I tell you, but it's about how you use the time to figure out what question you're hearing now. And it needn't be the same question your entire life. I don't think we need to have the same question. I don't think it's a singular question and a singular answer. Even in my understanding of God, is it possible to have a multivocal understanding of God or a multivocal, multi-perspectival understanding of the universe that there are different questions and uh, to be answered by different people in their own time and the fullness of their own lives? I think so. Is it too much to consider that that question might change and that we might listen to it and hear it differently? Might it be the same spoken words from the mount, from the cloud, right? And the meaning only becomes clear to us after a half century. I've lived more than a half century. So I feel good about that, but I feel questioning about what is it that I heard? I remember saying something to me way long ago. So question is to take for meditation, uh, what is your question now? And if it's changed for you, that's fine. If it rang clear as day to you when you were five years old, I know those people. I got, most of my congregants are over the age of 70. Uh, and I got people 93 years old, they knew what that question was when they were five years old and they're still living the answer and they, they sleep well at night. God bless those people. I, I, I try and learn from them. But tonight I want to call attention to the fact that we need to take the opportunity to reflect at this moment, particularly as we emerge from the disruption and dislocation, and for some, the trauma of this COVID era. Some, the trauma of the COVID era. It changed everything and it changed it fast. It's like the second week of March or something. And then it was like the last time I saw my congregation in person. And I remember talking about someone. I was with them on Friday and we were talking about, I was with a bunch of ministers, like one of our ministers group. Are we going to open church? I said, we should close church to be safe. And we never saw the people again. Just Zoom. Just Zoom like this. It changed in an instant. And we didn't understand that decision. I made the decision quickly. Well, why are we getting sick? Let's just close this week. We'll clear it up. We didn't 
we didn't exactly clear it up. But it's become so profound and so disruptive to life, it's taken on a different character. And again, without being a dangerous sort of Pollyanna who, who sees opportunity in disaster, I do see some kind of possibility in disruption that's worth attending to. And here's the part, I, I'll get bookish. And forgive me, I was trying to think of a Yale theologian. Uh, this is Michael Fishbane, who's a Jewish theologian out of the University of Chicago. And he was a Brandeis guy who went to Chicago. Brilliant, a brilliant man. And let me read from it. This is a book called Sacred Attunement. And actually, I hadn't thought about it until I started talking about it. I'm talking about attunement in our lives. That's his idea, this idea that there's something holy and sacred beneath it all. And I'll even say, you know, I just want to say, like, whatever it is, like, whatever is most deeply and fundamentally important, the really real, the truly true, that's what we're getting at, whether you, however you characterize that, as I say, is to somehow attune with that. Or another way to say that is to be providing an answer to the proper question that's been asked. Not go your whole life answering a question that's not asked or a question that's trivial. That's it. It's non-trivial to say, how will I get food to eat tomorrow? But I'll get into that to a minute. But we have a privilege, you know, moving up that hierarchy. We have that privilege. Maybe we're not worried about the food for tomorrow. Talk to me if you are. I'll hook you up. But if you're not, you have a privilege to say, am I answering the right question or am I still answering a question that was settled 35 years ago? That's it. But here I want to talk about what, what he talks about, rupture and revision. I'm going, to get, I'm going to read a little bit to you. The ruptures of routine and experience, Michael writes, that un unexpectedly undermine our ordinary lives. These occasions open, dis open a distinct space for reflection about the natural world and religious consciousness. It may happen in this way that the thoughtless ordinariness of daily life is jolted and gives way to a more elemental specificity. Suddenly something occurs that claims us with an overwhelming intensity. These experiences may fundamentally change our lives. For though the primal depths may close open, close over, excuse me, as this image of like this kind of actual tearing of the sheet, right? To see what's beneath, this, this lifting of the veil momentarily. Though they may close over and we return to more regular experiences of the world, the sense of depth may remain in mind. So that's kind of hopeful, kind of sense of these caesura, ruptures, caesarean, you know, like a cut, caesura, a cut in things that let us see within, which are traumatic, stressful, and, and frightening to our core in a way, but leave us transformed because we've seen beneath the artifice, from the, from the, the, the superficial, the epiphenomenal, to the really real, the truly true. And if we're lucky, we're changed. They may not. We may just retreat from it and say, God, thank God, that's over. What a mess. What a mess. Or we may have been reduced uh, by that to something uh, more basic and more real. Right? I'm a Unitarian, so I, I can't do a speech without talking about Thoreau, right? Thoreau, what did he, what did he talk about going to the cabin at Walden? To get to, to, to the base of life and to see for myself, is it, is it good? Is it good? Is it fine? And, and that's this opportunity we're invited to in this rupture of our lives is a kind of, in our own ways, you know, we've all gone to Walden <laughs> in one way or another. I hope you live on a beautiful, a beautiful pond. I never know. I, some people I think, I have congregants I've, you know, uh, never see. And I'm like, you have a beautiful mansion. And, you know, you learn it's, it's the photograph behind them. You know, and I, I was like, well, why are you always on the water? You have a boat. It's like, I just have a picture of a boat. That's what it is. But I hope you have that. But this period has been in one way or another going to Walden, whether we like it or not, whether we elected to or not. And then we had some choice as to how to make use of it. COVID is something we can make use of a little bit to see behind the veil of our ordinariness, of our ordinary existence. So I also want to acknowledge that the ability to have this be a reflective space right now, indeed, the ability probably even to be on this Zoom tonight reflects a kind of privilege, right? grounded in some set of resources we have that we might not spending a lot of time recognizing. What am I talking about? I'm talking about time. I'm talking about physical capacity. I am also talking about money, wealth. I spent a lot of time talking about that. 
and what that does in terms of it's one kind of obvious resource, but that and all the non-obvious resources. COVID, of course, has taught us that these sorts of resources have an insulating power. I confess I do live on this island. I had groceries delivered to my front porch. I do my work still by Zoom and they still pay me for it. It's all, it's, it's, it's wonderful. But things were different, of course. Your job disappeared. If your job involves working on a line closely with other people and disease exposure, if you didn't have health insurance, if you don't have a financial buffer, on and on and on, right? Disruption doesn't equal opportunity if it's eating you alive. So I, I want to say that for two reasons. One, because it's, it's consciousness of privilege and location. That's important. Two, because it affects how we're called. We're called, one, to do something for those uh, who are impacted in a different way. And two, we're called to make use of our privilege because privilege translates into power. And the greatest power of the kinds of resources I describe is not to build EOS 2, 305 feet. Those of you, somebody went offline and said, Google this, I can even build a bigger boat than that. It seems small. We've got a hedge fund manager here somewhere. She's already working on the boat. That's fine. That's fine. But the greatest value of these resources is the power to make choices for ourselves, right? It's absurd. I talk about strategy, business strategy, personal strategy. It's absurd to talk about strategy without power, by which I mean freedom and agency. And money might be sufficient, necessary, but not sufficient, is what I want to say. There's some other stuff going on. There's a reason why we're talking about it. If it was just cash, the market was over 31000 Oh, we're free. We're liberated by that. How wonderful that freedom feels. No, that's not it. That, that doesn't do it. We've experimented with it. We know up and down is neither captivity nor liberation. It's something else. I want to recognize that you have power to make choices. And you can make those choices right now in a life-giving way. And this is kind of a selfish talk today. I don't remember. Am I in the personal development track? This wasn't the saving the world track. So I'm just going to talk about making choices in a life-giving way for yourself on the theory that when your cup runneth over, there's, there's more that, that spills around you and it's transformative for the world around you. I think- Hey David, it's Steve Bloom. I'm just going to hop in there. There was a comment a little earlier uh, when you were um, discussing recognizing good and disaster. I thought it was really helpful and it may direct some of the things you're you're saying and thinking about it's why is seeing or recognizing good and disaster Pollyanna aren't we called to rise above our immediate lives and selves can't we be more hopeful anymore I just thought you'd be interested in hearing that comment yeah it's great and I really appreciate it because I love chat box I meant to say I super invite it because I have you know I'm gonna do my three hours and I if we save all the questions until the end you'll forget some of them but also I I'm trying to look at the screen. I don't look at the chat box. So anyway, thank you, Steve, for interrupting. Feel free to do it and feel free to toss stuff in the chat box, including where you're coming from and what you're experiencing. Um, yeah, Pollyanna-ish, I guess to the extent that uh, um, we don't make space for lament and we, we don't make space for people who are having different experiences than ourselves. I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm at a moment, the reason why I'm talking like this, I'm not in a moment of despair. I actually feel hopeful right now for a number. I, I apologize for that hopefulness, but I, I don't, but it's, I, I th think we're turning the corner, but whenever I'm used to preaching, you know, the, there's a practice, you know, sort of the mental walking of the pews and you're preaching from this location and you realize that there's this resurgence and it's all great, but not if, not if, uh, you know, you, you, you're one of the uh, so-called long haulers in COVID and still working to recover and the vaccine has nothing to do with that, you know, and so forth that, so those limitations that we are so quick to rush to the opportunity or something that we don't kind of have the space for human lament and the space for difference of experience. That's what I want to say. Um, Dave, while, while we're in the mode of, of interrupting and uh, you know, I know yeah. other folks can chime in, it really helped. I just want to ask, because one, one of the things the, this whole COVID thing has done is at least give me time to read more. And in particular, in places that I probably should have read in college, but I didn't. So uh, I've been taking a lot of time reading on the Stoics, right? So uh, I mean, is your message tonight aligned with that kind of thinking? You know, what's in your control, deal with. What's not in your control, don't deal with. Or you, is that antithetical? Because you've kind of weaved in and out a little bit of what you've been saying. Um, no, I mean, certainly uh, I'm thinking like 
the Enchiridion or something, you know, Epictetus, what would Epictetus say to us in the age of, uh, uh, of, of COVID? And indeed, indeed, there would be a place that would be untouched. I guess I'm recognizing, though, how much, that's why I say part of this lament is that, that these things, these things matter. And that we experience them. I'm probably uh, a little bit depart. Uh, there's some some ability to distance ourselves right now, but I'm saying that the ability to be a stoic relies on position. Indeed, the ability at the time to join Epictetus relied on your position in society, right? So just reflexively, <laughs> that, that that's what it is. There's a luxury in stoicism, but. A, a good practice nonetheless. But I wanna, I wanna live it and feel it. And I'm talking about a kind of engaged, I was just teaching before this, I was teaching we do a Buddhism class. And so we talk about that issue of attachment, which has a parallel in Stoicism. Like if your second mind, I'm talking about having that capacity for a second mind that can see the self um, living and, and make choices about it for the self, even though we have a kind of immersed emotional self which is uh, different. Is that helpful? Yeah, very, very much. Well, let, me, let me make this sort of turn. Um, I don't, and I, I mean, you put it in there. You tell me if you're at a moment of feeling possibility. I guess I, I'm feeling um, possibilities of shifts in the public sphere. I'm feeling possibilities of shift in the public health sphere. I'm feeling possibilities for my self, I don't know, for imagining what fall 2021 looks like and everything else and life is coming together in some ways. So I feel like it's a, it is that moment. And what I want to talk about that sort of, I talk about this as a limit, the liminal space, right? Between the page, between the chapters, where you get to breathe for a second, consolidate what just happened with, with what you anticipate and how we leverage liminality is what I'm concerned with. Yeah. And I invite you um, anytime. Keep doing it. Here's the thing. I, I was on. And, and David, there is a question that just popped in just before that, um, which, although it came to me privately, I think it's really meant for you. Oh. I, I'm curious if great loss accelerates the search for meaning. As someone who's been broken by loss, personal and professional, and come back stronger, I credit my perspective to those moments. I believe pain is the breaking of the shell that holds your understanding. Hmm. I think it's right. There's a little whiff of Viktor Frankl in there, right? And and that too, you know, uh, I'm reading Fishbane, who's a kind of post-Frankl and post-Holocaust uh, Jewish theologian, which looms large over all of that theologizing, which is how do we deal with kind of like ultimate rupture and hardship and is it, do we not exactly Nietzschean right not whatever kill doesn't kill us makes us stronger we don't we don't quite say that yet we can't deny how how rupture and trauma have shaped us and to the extent that we are resilient we have overcome and moved beyond I got kind of heavy with the Shoa but uh, that just brought when you the, the Frankel the search for meaning and that we're challenged to do that at times when the traditional, that's exactly what Fishbane is talking about, when the traditional structures fall away and whether it's dramatic like Frankel's experience or less dramatic that you show up at your firm one day and they say, you're done. What? <laughs> you know, I mean, or the company was just sold, you know, really. Sorry about The that. first of those two things happened to me. So I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah, not uncommon. And in that you say with all the, the structures of existence, are like, well, that's where my secretary sits and I'm doing this today and where's my count? All gone. And so, okay, okay, what is the new structure of existence that's underneath that? And what if we keep going? That's it. Like even just sort of si simple for those of us who are fortunate, we stop going to a place. I, just, I went to a church. I stand in a pulpit. I, there, there's a collection of practices, which is where I'm gonna get to, like the practices of life and it's stripped away. And the, the rhythm of life is gone and we, we've remade in this interim space, this liminal space, a kind of quasi life. And we're gonna come back into the fullness of life and we can, like Pet Cemetery, come back differently. Not exactly, uh, Stephen King reference. Anyway, we have the opportunity to come back differently. That's what I mean. There's some room for reinvention and what that's gonna be. Here's a- Got it.
I, so I wanted to quote this because I, I really enjoyed it. It was in our Facebook group, and I wish I could remember who posted it, but it stuck in my mind because they were quoting that by our Facebook group. I mean, there's a Yale alumni group, and it's lively and wonderful. And someone said this, they were quoting Kingman Brewster, who in speaking to them said, uh, uh, you'll never be this free again. So this is it to the undergraduates, you know, mm -hmm. these four years of college, you'll never be this free again. And I have a kind of different midlife proposition here that what if instead of nostalgia for college or grad school freedom, I loved grad school in New Haven lived on Whitney Avenue. My wife and I are honestly saying we should get a place in New Haven so we could go to Archie Moore's for wings. It was very, we just have like an absolute nostalgia for it. But instead of the nostalgia and getting the apartment on Whitney Avenue, what if the next four years were the freest four years of your life? That's what I want to suggest. That the gift of the rupture is making a choice right now if you've been equipped with those resources to, to make these the freest four years. <sighs> And don't wait, don't wait. I mean, maybe that's the case, but if the, the other freest four years are when you're 97 and in a nursing facility, that's not the same kind of thing as undergraduate. I mean, I'm not being, there's nothing wrong with assisted living facilities. I mean, like, you know, don't postpone the possibility of having this free space to begin to answer the question you feel compelled to answer. So this is an invitation tonight, really, to do this month of discernment of what is, what is it that my life is responding to is big, kind of the big question. And the really small question, which is what are the very specific practices that correspond to that big belief? This is one of my things I'm rabid about in church. It's like choosing your churches or your, 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 your religions are all about, give me, get, show me what your belief set. What do you guys believe? People come to my job. What do you believe? Uh, Show me what you do. Show me what you do. I'll figure it out, right? Luther, right? He said, preach always, use words when necessary. Just tell me what you do, how you live. I'm really interested in the practices because who cares what I believe? What are my practices? Do you brush your teeth in the morning? Okay, that tells me something about you and, and what question you're answering and what you see. And, and I want us to um, think about this radical freedom in really small ways. I mean, spend like 30 minutes thinking about this big question thing. And then the rest of the month, thinking about what are the practices that are, that are um, my life in action, responding to the question. So we talk, um, I read a book when I was a kid, and it said, um, love your neighbor as yourself. That stuck in my mind, that phrase. And what does it mean, this love your neighbor as yourself? I'm joking. So we say this all the time, just love your neighbor as, your, as yourself. Great commandment there. We use it freely. What does that look like break broken down in practices? Like in my neighborhood, I'll tell you the truth. You're learning a lot about my, my neighborhood. In my neighborhood, it means don't bother me. Don't make a lot of noise. Don't build anything that overlaps on my property line and, and clean up after your dog. For the love of God, clean up after your dog. That's it. That's what we want from each other here. You go ahead, type in there what neighborhood you're living in. I'm revealing what, what I should do, but I want to challenge that. So what is neighbor love and what would practices look like to actually do that? Uh, you know, I didn't hear that in the scripture. So should I run over my neighbor's name, Clay? I really like Clay. Should I run over and hug Clay before he goes to work? Wait, 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 stop. I'm not going to do that, right? So that's, that's silly. Should I give his dog a treat? When his dog comes, his dog comes every night. Shh, and I give the dog a treat. That feels kind of good. Should I learn the name of the neighbor three doors down? Okay, now I'm getting going from silly to real. Maybe I could start there. There's a practice of turning anonymous people into known people. Anonymous people into known people. And that's anonymous three doors down. I'm not talking about go somewhere else in the world and find needy people whose names you should know. I'm talking about like literal neighbors. I don't know their names. Um, you know, and so that's one of the simple practices to transform this next period of my life. And for instance, doing a certain kind of community weaving that I think is part of the life I'm called to. The question I'm answering involves that. And what about the person six houses down who's suffering? How do you know that someone's suffering in your neighborhood? It's God forbid, when someone's house burns down, then we're all there. It's not for a lack of responsiveness, but if we're just waiting for the houses to burn down to respond, it's pretty infrequent responses. 
the 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 widow inside the house six doors down i will never know unless i have a practice of communication this is really simple as i say it's small practices but what's the context to do that and am i going to have a turning of my practices here in covid and i don't um mean it's it, we're doing it right now that's why i sort of say this is we're we're exemplifying the moral ideal I'm advancing to you, which is we wouldn't be here if it wasn't COVID. And we have a circle of, of like moral compatriots, a circle of friends to be. This is a kind of a relational remaking of our world that is only happening because of COVID. And that's what I'm talking about. It can be in really small ways. It's not insurmountable. It's not a dream to meet the neighbor six doors down. I, I, like I'm saying, start small with practices. So, so were there any other questions? I want to do some sure. stop and check. Sure, there is a question that Angela uh, Angela Harris had. Um, Angela, would you like to share your question? Let's see where she is. Oh, it's not really a question. It's a statement. Okay. Do you want to share it? Sure. I, just. Thinking of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, it has been an equalizer. I mean, we're all suffering. We're all constricted. Um, we we all, you know, may have experienced some type form of loss, mm -hmm. but it simultaneously unveiled a, a host of pre-existing inequities that are now being magnified and exponentially multiplied. Um, and it's ironic that as you know, millions of people have lost jobs. Others have experienced um, record capital gains. Yes. And so many times the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and the folks in the middle are being squeezed um, more often than not um, to, to have less than, than they would have, you know, had we not had the pandemic. And it's just, you know, it's just the dichotomy of you know, this experiment that we call the United States. I'm not sure if any of you are still in Connecticut, but it's truly the land of the haves and the have nots. Um, it has some of the poorest cities in the nation in one of the per capita richest states in the union. And um, the pandemic has just um, really lifted that up in a just a disheartening way and you know folks that make policies you know this is an awful awfully good time to to start looking at some of those drivers for the inequities um and you know you talk about neighborly love you know if we're if we're not all okay um you know what's the point Right. Yeah, I think that's I think that's profoundly true. So when we talk about that concept of the unveiling, I, you know, there there's some of the the trauma created by the uh, COVID, and some of it that just was was laid bare, as you say, um, the kind of bimodal income distribution, you know, we're becoming we've been a classist, <laughs> a class driven society for a long time. Like uh, if if ever we could do a separate group on Wilkerson's book on caste. Which, is, which was timed so perfectly for understanding how caste and class and racism and all, all are working in tandem. And that book came out at the moment of, of, of COVID, um, which is abso absolutely right. We've become a kind of two-class system, an ownership class and a worker's class. And it's, it's, it's been paradoxically a wonderful time to own businesses that don't seem to need to employ people. Uh, so anyway, we could we could dwell on that. So that's part of the question here, right? That's part of the unveiling. And as I say, recognizing if you have the privilege to contemplate that, and have unveiled something about truth, the truth of our the world, right? The world we live in. How is that asking you a question differently than when that wasn't so obvious? And oh, I guess it wasn't that obvious to me ten years ago. Now it's it's so binary. Uh, it's hard to avoid. As I say, the difference between health insurance and not health insurance itself is a class divide, uh, much less, well, and it, it closely correlates to those who have, who own equity and stocks, the percentage of people who have 401ks and those that don't, and we don't even have to begin picking on the 1%. So I'm vigorously in agreeing 
And I think how it fits is one to say, it, this, it looks differently. How one is reimagining their life looks differently right now. That's why I started with the idea of privilege and power. That the priv privilege provides power, but the reality is a shared reality. And so my hope is that part of the question we're asked is, how do we live in a condition of radical interdependence? That was sort of what I was getting at with that. How do you, how do you be that religious question, which is how, how do you fulfill yourself as a self and be radically and completely part of the contiguous body, you know? So as a, the self-actualization has something to do with not having everyone die in the plague around you, even if you got the shot, right? right so. Thank you. That was really awesome. Uh, David, this made me think about the, the term that's been used a lot that we're all, uh, we're all not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm. Yeah. And I think that that kind of epitomizes what, what uh, Angela was talking about too, because some people are riding the storm out you know, in the raft, and other people are in the EOS, and um, and and I think that that that's where you know these practices that you're these small practices make a huge difference in in some people's lives. Um, and there's something about the radical interdependency too, which is that story about being in the same storm applies all the time. In this case, uh, I mean, because of the very particular uh, aspects of of infectious disease. Um, it really matters that, I mean, I, I, I don't care how much you make if you're sneezing on me. <laughs> we have an, inter, an undeniable interdependency. Right. right? And, and we can't shop. We can't walk down the street. And so the, these sorts of questions um, uh, are, are kind of inescapable. That mutual garment of destiny as we go come up on MLK's birthday. Uh, we're, you're in the garment. You're woven. And if you're in denial of that, that's another thing that's the, un that's what I mean by unveiling. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm not alone. The boat makes me feel alone or less grandiose. I mean, you keep picking on the poor guy on his Eos. But I mean, uh, it's a time of feeling alone, but we're never, we've never been more connected and more dependent on one another. So mutual dependency is kind of an unveiling that I'm seeing. And part of like, okay, wait, there's a different question being asked. And maybe there's a different answer. Mm -hmm. I went the other night. I didn't, I've really been squeamish uh, about um, social interaction. Because as I say, I serve a, a, a vulnerable populations, by which I mean older older folks and whatnot. Um, but we, we, so we volunteered for a week. We do an emergency shelter in Charleston when it gets below 40 degrees. The city opens a, an emergency gym. And so I said, well, for that, we can gear up and, and do it. And I, it's been a while to re unveiling of really obvious things and just thinking about all the people, right, who are unfed and unhoused. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is one of these really absurd ahas because I've, it's been 40, not, not 40 years, excuse me, 30 years I've been in soup kitchens and homeless shelters, but it's been a long time and I, I've been disconnected from it through COVID and just it hit me the realization of like, wait a sec, what is life in the midst of COVID outdoors in winter without food and without a ground blanket? I was trying to get a ground blanket for a guy who wanted one of the thick ones. And, and it's a kind of rediscovery. And that's an embarrassing thing to admit is like, oh, did you forget there were poor people past? Y yeah. <laughs> the re-forgetting <laughs> again and again that the, the veil comfortably drapes over the parts of the world to which we aren't forced to attend. And so the rupture, and we become more isolated from as we protect ourselves. And so I think that's right. We have that right. Let me, I, I, how much time do I have? Well, you still have time. It's 8.45. Okay. Are so we, we have 15 on? minutes. Okay. I'm going to do another I'm little sorry? closing. What's that? Sure. We go, we go to nine sharp. That's all we're trying to do. Nine sharp. We go to I'll nine. I'm talking. You guys yep. just leave. My wife will get me when it's time for bed. And I do this all the time. People, I just see people drop off like flies. It's like, I'm killing them. No, <laughs> no. I, the thing I was going to say, I had another little metaphor I was working with, which is, you know, I've been hiding inside and not eating out. And here, you know, I walked you down my street. I walked you over to the park where you could see the Eos. Down, we have our favorite shopping street here in Savannah. It's called Broughton Street, you know. And word came, I hadn't been, I haven't been down there in nine months, you know. 
uh, and close my eyes to it. And the word came that uh, it has two things. It has my favorite pizza place. The kids love it. And the best ice cream in Savannah. Two ends of Broughton Street. And the word came that our pizza place closed. Our pizza place collapsed on Broughton Street. So I went down and sort of did the tour. And it's a geography of collapse and contraction. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a very physical manifestation as, as the whole start to appear in what was a kind of, you know, affluent, you know, street of celebration. And, you know, we're very, we're kind of party town and everything else. And, and it's just every third door is, is, is now empty. And you see this disappearance. And I don't feel, uh, you know, it calls us to a few, a few things, right? It's, and that's why I go back to that point, which is okay to lament the loss of things that we loved. It's important that we turn to say, well, you lost your pizza, brother, but someone else lost their job that they were feeding their family on, right? So like in that relationship, we ought to be thinking about like, what, is, what are the systems for that, that we as a community respond in ways other than eating pizzas? Again, a pizza has been a recurrent theme of this. So that, that's really important. But the third way, and this is the hopeful, optimistic one, has to do with seeing the open spaces. And it's kind of hopeful to me because I believe pizza's coming back and maybe it's not pizza. My hope, I, I'm actually one of my self discoveries is, uh, or questions that I can answer is, what can you feed people, Dave? I like, I love cooking for people. That was also my aha is at the shelter, like feeding people. And I was like, I love feeding people literally. This is even more fun than preaching. So I'm fantasizing about Kaiten Zushi in this little Southern town that I'm gonna put in that pizza parlor place. And and that's what's feeding me right now, this sort of imagination, constructive imagination um, in response to what I want to call invitations to creation. And so the open spaces you're seeing as we come out of this time, I, I want you to do those first things I talked about, but then I want you to hear an invitation to creation. I want you to hear a question anew. What can you create to fill the space that has been left? See the voids. And that's reality. And then see them as a call, especially if you have privilege and power, to fill them anew. In a harsh stripping down of our world, absence becomes more visible. And as we say, some of it's caused by COVID and some of it's same as it ever was. <laughs> oh, look, systemic racism. Wow, too bad uh, COVID caused that. No, it's an unveiling. And we say never more acute. Mm -hmm. is this condition that we're in and that we see it let us hear it as an invitation to creation is where i i want to end it i want to end with saying i want you to see those invitations to creation in your relational lives like i said reach out who are the people you got you've got a best friend from yale days who you could be sitting on zoom with every month and reconnecting you can be rebuilding support networks you can be strengthening your extended family this is i don't know what the call is but I know the call involves other people and interdependence and relationships. This is an example of that. I want you to hear vocational calls anew. What is this next chapter? I, I know, I joke, but there's venture capital money here. There, there's people who have choice about where they work and who they work with, what board they sit on and everything else. And then I want you to hear the calls about self. I want, I want you to take your faith life seriously by which I mean the deepest things, whether you contextualize those religiously or not, I want you to take your bodies seriously. The last time, your last freest time, you were 18 to 22, you probably treated your body poorly. Now, if you're older than that, let's give some gentle care to ourselves. Reimagine, answer the question of what it is to show gentle care to the creature that you are. That's what I want to say. I'm going to, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to... Um, just wish you that you have new practices emerging in your life, that you see possibilities that you didn't see before, and that most of all, we do it together. It's not a solo project. It's a group project, right? Isn't that what Yale is about? Everything was a group project. You're in a group project now. This is your team. Make use of it. Thank you, David. That's great. Uh, well, someone mentioned, Mary Ann Hamilton said, when we help others, we'll make it a better world for ourselves as well. It's a win-win situation. That's so, and one of the things that when we talk to students, uh, we, we, you know, we use that silver lining thing. But, but one of the things that the students said when they were stuck at home earlier in the pandemic was that they connected more. They, it was the first time they'd really felt 
like being home with family meant a lot to them that like they got to know their parents or they felt good about it and it was across the board that all the students we talked to felt that way which I thought you know that talk about you know from a perspective of you know close family to have you know your teenager or your early college student home and feeling like it's really important that that, that they're with you and support you is really special yeah, that, that's David, I, just, I just want to say a personal thank you uh, I think this was great great yeah time for us and and boy what a way to finish it was always that one professor who finished five six minutes early it was the best day ever yeah it's a gift right <laughs> you, all got A's. You. you all got A's and we're done early so David, that's fabulous. No, we really appreciate it. And uh, we, have, another question. we have food for thought to take away with us. Yeah, if there's any other questions. Yep. Thank um, you all. You've all been generous to be here and thanks for having me. Okay. Take care. All right. Take care, David.